I am John Lorex from International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. And uh, this is another in what we hope will be a continuing series of conversations with people who are working for the elimination of nuclear weapons. Melissa Park is a lawyer and parliamentarian who has worked with the United Nations on international humanitarian and human rights issues in several conflict areas. She is a former Minister for International Development and a former Member of Parliament for the Labour Party in Australia. She was the Australian Chair of Parliamentarians for Global Action and was founding chair of the Australia United Nations Parliamentary Group. She's been deeply involved with nuclear issues since the 1990s, campaigning against the establishment of a global nuclear waste dump in her home state of Western Australia. More recently, Ms. Park has served as an ambassador for ICANN Australia, promoting the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons since its adoption by the UN in 2017. On September 1st, Ms. Park took a new position as Executive Director of ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. She joins us from Geneva. Melissa, welcome, and thanks for taking the time to talk about your new appointment with ICANN. In addition to anti-nuclear campaigning, you've been involved with environmental issues and human rights and humanitarian work around the world, and you've worked both in Australia and globally. What led you to focus on the elimination of nuclear weapons at this point in your career? Well, um, delighted to be here with you, John. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I guess uh, through my UN experience working in places like Kosovo, Gaza, Lebanon and Yemen, I came to see firsthand the impact of war on civilians. Um, as you mentioned, I've had involvement with nuclear issues throughout my life, including most recently as a parliamentarian and as uh, an ICANN Australia ambassador. Uh, but right now, um, this is a really scary and dangerous time for the world. We're seeing rising tensions, mounting conflict, the renewal of nuclear threats. It's never been more important or urgent for the world to take action to eliminate nuclear weapons. And we've seen just last month or two months ago, the UN Secretary General issued his new agenda for peace in which the number one recommendation was the elimination of nuclear weapons. Um, but rather than condemning nuclear threats and uh, dismantling their arsenals as nuclear armed states are required to do under the Non-Proliferation Treaty, Nuclear armed states have instead been, in response to nuclear, these new nuclear threats, have been uh, threatening reprisals and they've been modernising and expanding their nuclear arsenals. Um, so we have a great challenge ahead of us, but also, I think, a great opportunity to bring people together, um, to let them know there is another way through diplomacy and dialogue uh, and through the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Um, which uh, I can help to have adopted at the UN General Assembly. Uh, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons provides a clear pathway to disarmament, uh, which other um, treaties around nuclear issues do not. So this is, the way, this is the way forward as I see it, and that's why I'm really excited to be part of this campaign right now. Mm -hmm. Well, ICANN uh, has evolved through several phases uh, since it's launched by IPPNW in 2007. Um, so maybe a little historical recap would be good here. Uh, early on, the campaign was attempting to gather public support for a nuclear weapons convention. Uh, and it was really sort of an internal IPPNW campaign. And, and we realized that in order to have any kind of real impact, this was going to have to open up and become a global campaign. So uh, we quickly brought in a lot of other partner organizations and the campaign just sort of grew like topsy. Um, and as it expanded, uh, it also shifted strategy to, uh, to work for a treaty banning nuclear weapons, mostly working with, with non-nuclear weapon states to do that. Uh, and uh, it became the civil society coordinator for the UN process that produced the, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons that, that you just mentioned. Uh, and that happened in 2017. Uh, for the past five years, ICANN has focused on the signature and ratification process 
in order to grow the treaty's membership uh, and on practical work to implement specific prohibitions and obligations such as financial divestment uh, from nuclear weapons activities, uh, victim assistance, and environmental remediation. Uh, so that's sort of where ICANN has come from. Where do you see ICANN's priorities being for the next, I don't know, say two to five years? Uh, and what are the things that you think are going to be most important for the campaign to be working on? Great. Thank you, John. Um, look, can I just start by giving a big shout out to IPPNW, um, yourselves being a Nobel Peace Prize winning organisation, then establishing another Nobel Peace Prize winning organisation. It's a pretty amazing uh, set of achievements. Uh, and of course, uh, I can start it in Australia uh, back in 2007. And, um, and I, I have obviously but quite very familiar with ICANN Australia and, and and all of the wonderful people there. It's sort of um, like we're going back to our roots here. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, and of course, so ICANN's grown into this amazing civil society movement made up of more than 670 organisations. And uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's a, a massive amount of people power right there. Um, so ICANN's priorities um, for me coming in, I really want to see that we emphasise the interconnectedness of um, nuclear weapons with many other issues, uh, including development, health, human rights and the environment. Um, you know, we're seeing billions being spent on modernising and expanding nuclear arsenals uh, at the cost of investment in genuine human security, including development, disarmament, uh, diplomacy, and um, environmental protection. And I know that IPPNW has been emphasizing the nuclear weapons uh, links to health since its inception. And um, uh, the great um, Dr. Harry Cohen, I don't know if you know him personally, John, but um, he's from MAPW in Perth. Uh, and has been campaigning on this issue for uh, his life. Um, but, you know, he made the, uh, the the statement that nuclear war is bad for everyone's health. So I'll be quoting Harry a lot uh, as I go forward. And, of course, we saw in August um, more than 150 medical journals from around the world, including The Lancet, uh, putting out a joint call for action to eliminate nuclear weapons as a public health priority. Um, they referenced the Nature Food Journal um, study, which concluded that even a limited nuclear war uh, involving, say, um, India and Pakistan would kill 120 million people outright and put uh, 2 billion people at risk from global climate disruption. And a major nuclear war would put something like at least 5 billion people at risk. In terms of human rights, um, can there be any greater infringement of human rights than nuclear weapons? Uh, looking at the right to life, looking at the right to health, the right to family, the right to a healthy environment. Uh, basically, I don't, I don't think there are any rights that are not infringed by, uh, by nuclear weapons. So uh, this, this is an area where we'd like to see... Um, other organisations that are involved in these issues come out and talk about include nuclear weapons in their in their statements, so, like, including the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and the World Health Organization. Um, and finally, in terms of uh, the environment, I really um, am very keen for ICANN to build a greater alliance with the climate and biodiversity movements. Um, given that nuclear weapons have an impact on both of those other existential threats. Uh, we know that nuclear war um, may become far more likely due to a climate crisis driven um, resource uh, um, scarcity and conflict. Um, science now has established that um, a nuclear winter um, caused by nuclear war would have a devastating impact upon all life on Earth. Uh, because the soot that would go into the upper atmosphere 
that block out the sunlight and cause mass crop failure and mass starvation. Um, so essentially the, the abolition of nuclear weapons is an essential part of um, respecting and protecting the planet, the climate, humanity and all living things. Um, I, I wanted to uh, give a shout out to some uh, Japanese research this year, Kunio Kaiho from Tohoku University, Professor Kunio Kaiho, uh, who concluded that the priority for animal species conservation must be one, to prevent nuclear war, two, to decrease deforestation rates, three, reduce pollution, and four, limit global warming in that order. Um, this research highlights the fact that while every species will be harmed in a nuclear war, only one species can stop it. So um, basically, this, this what I've been talking about is, is where I think we need to go, emphasizing the interconnectedness of nuclear weapons with all of these other issues, uh, mm -hmm. development, health, human rights and environment, and uh, potentially others as well. Mm -hmm. That's what we'll be focusing on. Great. And not to take us too far off track here, but I think something a lot of people don't understand, e even people who sort of can envision the mushroom cloud and understand what a nuclear war would do, um, don't necessarily understand the health and environmental problems that are caused uh, just by the, the production and uh, deployment of nuclear weapons around the world, uh, the, the health effects on on nuclear plant workers. I was just reading another book about Hanford and uh, oh, yes. horrible health problems. Oh, that... Joshua Frank, was that Atomic Days? Uh, no, it wasn't that one. Uh, this one was by uh, a woman, I think her name is Amy Cram. Okay. And uh, she uh, grew up and, and lives around Hanford, is now a professor uh, at a university in, in Washington state. And this is very personal for her because she is a, a cancer survivor and all of her family members have gotten cancer uh, as a result of um, radiation exposure and toxic exposure around those plants. So even, even without using nuclear weapons in a war, nuclear weapons are killing us. Um, yeah. And, and so I think we've yeah. got to, you know, to really get focused on this. And, and I'm so glad that, that you're there doing it. Thank um, you. So to get back on track here. <laughs> um, so uh, we just had a, a few months ago uh, another meeting of the, the member states of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, which yeah. uh, you know many people consider the, the sort of cornerstone of nuclear disarmament and arms control. Uh, and yet uh, the disarmament obligations within the NPT just never seem to get implemented. And the NPT process itself has, has kind of become very stagnant and dysfunctional. Uh, so we just had another meeting uh, back earlier in, in the summer, the, the Northern Hemisphere summer, for my Australian friend, <laughs> where uh, they just they ended in failure. Uh, they couldn't even agree on, on publishing uh, an agile program of the work that they did. Yeah. Um, so this is a real problem. On the other hand, the TPNW, the, the Treaty on the Prohibition of, of Nuclear Weapons, is coming up for its second meeting of states parties in uh, November of this year. Uh, and uh, this is a very different kind of process and a very different kind of treaty. And um, uh, so I'm wondering what you and, and I can think needs to be on the agenda for the second meeting of, of the TPNW. And, um, what kind of uh, sort of practical activities and priorities do you think the treaty should be setting for what, what, what should we see on the agenda and what would you like to see as the outcome? I guess that's the question. Great. Well, um, Mexico will be chairing the second meeting of states parties in which goes from 27th of November to the 1st of December. Uh, and Mexico will obviously then set the agenda in consultation with other states, but also in consultation with ICANN. And we are very strongly recommending that the meeting continue to highlight the humanitarian and environmental consequences of nuclear weapons. 
we know that ambassadors and diplomats for different countries change quite frequently. And so it's important that everyone has the opportunity to hear about and understand the impact of nuclear weapons use and testing on human beings and why it can never be allowed to happen again. Um, the meeting of states parties will also hear from the coordinators of the various working groups that were set up under the, uh, the first meeting of states parties in Vienna last year uh, and under what's called the Vienna Action Plan. Um, and that includes working groups on universalization, on uh, complementarity, on verification and on victim assistance and remediation, as well as a scientific advisory group. And you, you mentioned earlier the, the NPT. Well, there is quite a significant contrast between the NPT and the TPNW processes. Um, as you mentioned, the, the NPT process is stalled. It, it's mired in division. Uh, we hasn't seen any progress on disarmament for decades. Um, by contrast, um, the TPNW is the place where disarmament action is happening. Uh, the number of states parties is growing and we fully expect that by the time of the second meeting of states parties, we will have more than half the countries of the world having um, signed up to the treaty. Um, the TPNW gives a powerful voice to those countries and uh, peoples and individuals who've uh, traditionally been marginalised and sidelined. Um, it's a participatory process that hears from experts and survivors uh, of nuclear weapons use and testing. Civil society uh, has a has a place at the table and uh, is a member of the um, the coordinating committee for the treaty. Uh, and that's and that's not a not a frequent occurrence. So that's a really great achievement for this treaty. Uh, we expect the meeting to call uh, on all states to abandon the nuclear deterrence theory and uh, to condemn nuclear sharing and testing. Um, and you'll note that that's quite a topical matter right now with Russia uh, looking into whether it will withdraw from the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And of course, we're urging uh, that that not occur. I, I think it's important to point out that uh, the NPT and the TPNW are, are not in competition with each other. In no, any no, way. The, the, the goals of disarmament are the same. The problem within the NPT is the process and, and the fact that the nuclear armed states and their allies have kind of undermined all of the disarmament initiatives and obligations within that treaty and make it very difficult to implement them. Um, but the NPT does say that it's it's all states' obligation to pursue nuclear disarmament. And so the TPNW says, okay, that's what we'll try to do. We're going to, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, not the non-nuclear weapon states will try to fill in that gap and, and take on our, our own nuclear disarmament responsibilities this way. Yes. So, and, and so they should work together. Yeah, they, they do. And the TPNW actually contains a, a, a statement saying that it is complementary. Right. To MBT, it builds on the MPT, it provides the disarmament verification mechanism that the MPT doesn't actually have. So uh, it, it's completely complementary and, um, and works hand in hand with the MPT and strengthens it, frankly. Mm -hmm. Elsewhere in the world, we've got uh, an ongoing war in Ukraine um, that has really exacerbated the confrontation between nuclear armed states in Europe and the US. Um, and now we have the outbreak of war between a, a nuclear armed Israel and, and Hamas in the Middle East. Um, all of the nuclear armed states, you, you've mentioned this, are, are spending massive amounts of money on new nuclear weapon systems in nearly every region of the world. Um, could you reflect a little bit maybe on the problem of public engagement as it relates to ICANN's goals? Because the public voice in, in all of this, especially when we've got these huge conflicts raging, kind of tends to get a bit lost and we've got to get it up front again somehow. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, you, you're right. The war in Ukraine, the uh, uh, and now uh, elsewhere, uh, as we've seen uh, just this last week, um, rising tensions on the Korean Peninsula as well. Uh, the movie Oppenheimer, they've all uh, really brought the issue of nuclear weapons back into public consciousness after it's lain dormant for some time uh, uh, once the Cold War finished. Um, I think the big challenge for our campaign in terms of, you know, public consciousness about this is is the propaganda from the nuclear armed states and their, mm -hmm. and their allies with the enthusiastic participation of the mainstream media, I might add, um, regarding the inevitability of war, the need to prepare for war, uh, the vital role of nuclear deterrence. Um, that's that's the the drumbeat that we're getting um, from from all you know most of the media. Um, so I think you know we need to see this as an opportunity to point out the contradictions and inconsistencies in their arguments. Uh, they all have policies supporting nuclear disarmament uh, and a nuclear weapons free world. Uh, if they thought that uh, nuclear weapons were a recipe for global stability, then why do they have those policies? Uh, why aren't they encouraging everyone to have nuclear weapons? But instead, what they do is they maintain that their possession of nuclear weapons, but not anyone else's, is essential for global stability and uh, keeps us all safe. Whereas we know the reality is that nuclear weapons do not keep us safe. Um, they make the world infinitely more dangerous, uh, threaten life on earth every moment. Uh, with the thousands of nuclear weapons being kept on high alert, uh, there could be a mistake or a miscalculation at any time. We're also, uh, we've also seen the increased role of artificial intelligence in the military. Yeah. Uh, which raises the stakes around nuclear weapons, uh, reduces the time available for nuclear decision making. Um, cyber, hacking, cyber hacking is rampant, and uh, I think that's it's a problem for every government, every organisation, every business, every individual um, is working out how to deal with this issue. And can any nuclear armed state honestly guarantee that their nuclear weapon systems? will never be hacked. I mean, I don't know how they can guarantee that. So emphasising these vulnerabilities, it will be important to getting the message through. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, there's the opportunity to align with the environment and other movements mm -hmm. um, to see that an essential element of a clean, safe and peaceful world is the absence of nuclear weapons. Uh, smart social media campaigns using um, uh, horror, hope and humour, I think is the, is the phrase, um, uh, tailored to different countries will be um, a way of cutting through to audiences. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, try to get some uh, other like UN agencies on board more than they are now. Um, so you, you're talking about the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, High Commissioner for Refugees, the UN Environment Program, the World Health Organization, the UN Development Program, uh, and, and others. So I, I think we there are challenges, but we also have opportunities and we need to use um, technology to uh, in our favor. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm sort of reformulating this last question in my head as you speak, mm -hmm. um, because I'm, I'm realizing I've been doing this for a very, very long time. This mm -hmm. work. Um, you're considerably younger than me, but you've been doing it for a while yourself. One of the things that that I just love about ICANN is how young this campaign is and how many young people have now um, gotten familiar with the nuclear weapons issue and have really decided that, that their future depends upon doing something about it. So um, imagining for a minute that I have not now answered the question for you, 
what is it that it, and maybe you have other things to say too what is it that excites you the most about now working with this really motivated group of nuclear abolitionists yeah and and that's you've just hit the nail on the head because it, it is an incredibly dedicated um, group of people all around the world and and more and more young people getting engaged in the issue and that's really exciting uh it's you've got you know, enlightened governments, civil society um, coming together, and uh, I think we can we can achieve miracles. Um, I don't think anyone actually thought that the treaty would get ever get see the light of day, and and now we have a treaty. I beg your pardon, I did. Oh, you did. <laughs> I did. Yeah. Well, I think there were some doubters uh, out there. But, I mean, it, it, it's an amazing achievement. You're right. It really is, right. and so. Things, everything seems impossible until it happens and then suddenly it seems like, well, it was, it was natural. But so you, I think you've just got to keep um, inspiring more people to realise that they can do something to help, that every individual can play a role, uh, whatever their skills and experience. So as part of Nuclear Ban Week in New York um, for the second meeting of states' parties, we're going to be featuring artists against the bomb. Um, there will be classical music um, concerts and performances. There will be an event on Wall Street to encourage financial institutions to divest from nuclear weapons investment. Um, and there are many things that individuals can do and be encouraged to do, uh, which is very personally empowering for them. Um, there's like the I Can Cities campaign and the Mayors for Peace campaign. People can urge their local governments to, to join those. People can write to their and request meetings with their uh, federal members of parliament to ask them their government to support the TPNW. Um, they can write to their pension funds and just ask them um, to divest from nuclear weapons. Um, I, think, I think that's for me. It's about empowering people to realise that they can make a difference. And um, I... I saw this wonderful quote from uh, the American activist for children and civil rights, Marion Wright Edelman, who said, um, it's important not to become apathetic or cynical by telling ourselves that nothing works or makes a difference. Every day, light your small candle. So we all, each of us, can light our small candle. And when many people do that, uh, we end up with a world full of light. Well, this is you know such a, a daunting and and even frightening set of issues that we have to deal with, um, and and I think that uh, it's good to end on a really uplifting note like that. So, uh, Melissa Park, thank you for for joining us and for taking some time to to talk about ICANN and and what you hope to accomplish there. We're right with you. And uh, great pleasure, John. Maybe some somewhere down the line, we'll we'll get together again and and have an update on how things are going. That would be lovely. Thank you. All right. Thank you.